it says the the measures of the angles of a triangle are the extended ratio of seven to three to two. Find the measures of the angles. So I think it's a it's a good idea maybe to draw a picture and uh, allow that now allow that picture to maybe uh, provide you insight on what you're supposed to do. But then once you've done this maybe one time, two times with the picture, hopefully you kind of realize the procedure is consistent or the same and, and the picture is something that you don't have to write. But here's the idea. They're saying that you have maybe maybe somebody has already done the problem and they know what these three angles are and they looked at them and they compared them and they all reduced by the same thing. Right. So maybe and maybe the angles were uh, just to make things easy, 20, uh, 60, and 100. You all those have a common factor in them? The 20s, let me write these down. 20, 60, 100, right? Those would all kind of go down to at least 2, 6, 10, but then they would go even further to 1, 3, 5, right? So if those were the three angles, this ratio provided would be 1, 3, 5, right? Okay. So obviously we know that those, those are not the answers for this, but that's kind of the idea that we want to go through and, and think about as we understand that relationship. We are now starting at this line here and trying to work our way back up to that. Yeah, so we're starting with the reduced version and trying to unreduce it. Uh, when we think about what the reduced version is, we've, we've divided everything by some number, right? If I divide something out, what is the opposite or the inverse of division? Multiplication. So to undo the division that's happened, the reduction that's happened to get me to 732, I can actually multiply 732 by that thing that got factored out, right? So we factored out, if I look at that, we factored out, what, a 10 out of each of those? Uh, and then, uh, I actually we factored 20 out of each of them, right? Okay, so a 10 and then a 2. Uh, so if I start with the 1, 3, 5, and I amplify the 1 by 20, I get the 20. If I amplify the 3 by 20, I get my 60, right? If I amplify my 5 by 20, I get 100, right? So did I amplify every one of those by the same amount? Yes, and that's what we have to do if we're... If we're thinking about how the reduction happens. When, when you reduce fractions or ratios, it's the same amount gets taken out each time, out of each part. Um, so, if I've got 732, they've been reduced by something, let's unreduce them by something. Now, we don't know what that something is, so I'm going to call it X. I'm going to call that X, and I'm put that X back into the 3, and I'll put that X back into the 2, right? Okay? So, the idea here, then, is if... If I look at these as a ratio, is the x a common factor out of all of them? Can I take that x out and still get 732? Okay, so that's kind of verification. I do have the ability to do this. This is okay, all right? Uh, but the x has to be the same, okay, in each, each situation. If x was 1, that would make one angle 7, one of them 3, one of them 2. Is that going to make three angles of a triangle? No, because what do they have to add up to? 180. Okay, so maybe X is 2, so one of these would be 14, the other would be 6, and the other would be 4, right? Still not 180, correct? Now, my hopes are is that you realize that you don't want to go through and say, okay, well, if X is 1, X is 2, X is 3, and do that trial and error thing, because that's going to be a pain in the butt. And there will be times where you don't try uh, the right numbers, because maybe the answer is a, uh, a fraction itself, and all you've tried were the, the integers. Does that make sense? Okay, so... The relationship is that that represents one of your angles. Add that to your other angle. Add that to your third angle. And they should all three total to 180, right? Okay. So how many X's does that give you total? 12X is equal to 180, right? Okay. Uh, when I divide that, uh, I get what? Uh, 15. So X is 15. So now if X is 15, that means one angle must have been 7 times 15. The other angle must have been 3 times 15. And the other one must have been 2 times 15, right? We see that 15 is constant or common in all those, right? So it's a common factor. It's a GCF that could have been taken out to give me a 7 to 3 to 2 relationship. 
So if they want the um, angles, the actual angles of this triangle, what's 7 times 15? 105. 3 times 15? 45. 2 times 15? is 30, right? Do those three things add to 180? And if we reduce them, if we solve the common factor of 15 and then divide every one of those by 15, we get 7, 3, and 2. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, my hope is that you, when you see a question that asks you like an extended ratio like this, at 7, 3, 2, that's the approach that you're going to use. So, so my hopes are that you don't, every single time, work through uh, that type of question, that delivers to that much time on. That makes sense? They're all very similar. Uh, you're going to see... There were some with like side lengths of rectangles and stuff like that, and asking about areas. And uh, let's see if do anybody have any trouble with those. What about this one? Is this one talking about a triangle? It says the measures of three angles, if sum is 128, are in the extended ratio of 3 to 5 to 8. Is that a triangle? No, because they can't sum the 128, right? So maybe your picture, and they don't have to be this way, but maybe your picture is that's one angle. Maybe that's another angle. And maybe this is your third angle. Okay, so we've got those three angles. They're in a three to five to eight relationship to one another. So that's the smallest they could individually be, right? To maintain a three to five to eight relationship. Um, but do those numbers add to 128? Is three plus five plus eight equal 128? No. Uh, what if I doubled it? I get six, 10, and 16, right? Does that add to 128? Nope. So I, I got to double it, triple it, quadruple it. I'm not sure which number I got to use uh, to enlarge these, but it is a common value in all of them. And those three then need to sum to 128. So that's 3x plus 5x plus 8x equals 128. Does that end up being a pretty similar style equation of what the last question was? It's just a different sum, different total. Um, I know there was one in here that dealt with winning baseball games and something like that, right? It's five. All right. Baseball team played 161 regular season games. The ratio of number of games they won to the number of games they lost was two to five, right? How many games did they win and how many games did they lose? All right, this question uh, can be answered two different ways, but since we've been doing this extended ratio kind of example, it's see if we can do the same thing here. If I look at uh, 2 over 5, and that's uh, games won to games lost, right? Can you write that as 2 to 5 that way? That's games won and that's games lost? Does that make sense? Okay. If I look at it as that, Okay, is 2 to 5, is that ratio the same thing as 4 to 10? Is that the same as the ratio uh, 6 to 15? Okay, so they all reduce to 2 to 5, right? But if I reduce it to 2 to 5, how many games total have been played there? If it's just 2 to 5, that's the ratio that we're using. 7. If it's 4 to 10, how many games have you played? 14, right? If I have 6 to 15, how many games have I played? 21. Do you think I could keep enlarging these and sum them together to get eventually uh, a total of 161? Well, think about it this way. That means that this 2 is going to get enlarged by some multiple, right? This 5 needs to be enlarged by some multiple, right? So would you agree that that multiple needs to be the same in both cases? And if I add the games that I've won to the games that I've lost, shouldn't that equate to the number of games that I've played? An extended ratio in this a question like this, an extended ratio could be they incorporate maybe ties into it as well. So you can see that you would have three parts. Uh, but this just wins and losses. So let's say give me 7x is equal to 161, right? X then ends up being 23. So x is the number that we need to enlarge those two numbers by that gave us 2 to 5. So if I kept doing this procedure, eventually 
I would get to uh, a number of wins that would be 46, because that's 2 times the 23, and a number of wins that would be, or sorry, number of losses that would be 115. If I take 46 plus 115, it gives me 161. And 46 plus 115 adds up to 151. So that's the number of games I've played, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I like doing it that way. That's not the only way you can do it, but I like doing it that way so you can see that, that that's the same question as that triangle question. It's the same question as that uh, three angle question. But you could do it another way. And, and this is where uh, you've got to think, though, in regards to the ratios you're set up. We, we could write a proportion here. Right? We can say, that we've got two fifths. Two fifths is games won and games lost. Okay. I want to determine out or not determine how many um, games I've won out of 161. So I want to write another ratio. I want to write another ratio using 161. I don't want to talk about wins. So how many wins? Let's put a W there. How many wins do I get out of 161? Now the thing is, I cannot equate those two things. Because look at this, this, these numerators, these numerators are uh, relatable, right? Wins and wins is, wins and wins is, wins and wins, right? Okay, they're, they're relatable. Um, this is wins and losses, okay? But this is wins and total games, right? <coughs> this need, if this is wins and losses, this needs to be wins and losses, okay? Uh, so that's a problem. But this is total games. If I know out of out of two wins for every five losses, does that mean I have two wins out of seven games? Does that make sense? So now this is in a re relationship of wins to games. This is wins to games. I cross multiply now. I get seven x. Multiply those, seven x, cross multiply those. Uh, one or sorry, three thirty-two. Right? Three thirty-two or three point two. Three point two. Okay. So then I put and divide out by seven. Okay, thirty-two divided by seven is four. Okay. I would have, um, what did I mean, 46? Is that right? What is it? Put in my math here. Tell me out here, guys. That's right. Is that 43? Yeah, 46. Okay. Yeah. So, and 46, that was the same number came up with the last approach, right? The set or the 2x plus 5x equals 161. Okay. Um, so I get 46. Now X represents games won, right? So if I've played 161 games and I've won 46 of them, I subtract those and find out how many I've lost. Okay? So that's something we can do, but what a lot of people want to do is they just want to take two fifths equals X over 161, and you can't do that because this is wins to losses, and this is wins to total games played. This needs to be wins uh, to losses, or this needs to be wins. All right. Okay. Uh, just something to think about. Two different ways, two different approaches to that question. Um, the let's see here. Were, were there any others in there that you guys want to talk about? Any other examples? Another? The area one. Okay. Do you know what question it was? Number twelve. All right, so we did uh, the sum of angles, right? Um, if, and I'm not sure, I know, I know there was a class that we, we missed a, an example in uh, the notes. I uh, just ran out of time. There was one with a like, perimeter of triangle size um, in, in the PowerPoint. Um, there are these kind of overall governing concepts that are guiding these questions, right? One concept is that there's 180 degrees in uh, three angles of a triangle. One concept is a perimeter is I add up all the side lengths. 
Uh, one concept uh, is that you know we have three angles at 4.8. Okay. Um, this con, this governing concept here is area, right? How do you find area? Yes, for for this picture, for this image, a rectangle's area is length times width. Okay. Uh, so that's the governing thing here that we got to do uh, to deal with this question. If that's my rectangle, and that's my length, and that's my width, area is the product of those two things. Okay. So, here it says the ratio of the length to the width is 4 to 3, okay? So, the length is 4, the width could be 3, right? That's a ratio of 4 to 3, okay? But when I multiply them together, do I get that 12? Sorry, no, do I get that 108? No, it's 12, right? I said that backwards. All right, so, uh, maybe this is, just like the other ones, that's 8, and maybe that's 6, if I'm going to put 8 and 6 together, do I get 108? No, I get 48, right? So there's some multiple of 4 and some multiple of 3 that when we multiply together, we're going to get 108, right? So I'm going to put that multiple on my length as 4x. I'm put my multiple on my width as 3x. But now here's, here's the... The governing rule is that area is length times width. Well, my length I just now defined as 4x. My width I just defined as 3x. And that should total an area of 108, right? So previous questions, we were adding the 4x and the 3x together. But now we're multiplying them. So what's 4 times 3? 12, right? And what's x times x? x squared. So then we get 108 over here. Now this is... This is actually a quadratic equation, but it's one of the easier ones, okay, because it doesn't have a middle term, okay? Every quadratic equation is going to be of this form, where you have an x squared, an ax squared, and right now that's our 12x squared. You are going to have a bx, but right now our bx actually has a coefficient of zero, so it disappeared, it's gone, and that's nice for this. And our c is our constant, in that case it's the 108. Um, if you have something like this, this is a special case scenario. The easiest way to solve this, isolate your x squared. So I'm going to divide both sides by 12, right? What is 108 divided by 12? 3, 9, right? Okay. Now, if I get x squared equals 9, how can I solve for x? Square root. Square root that side, square root that side, right? And the only thing you got to be cautious of is when I do this, I get x to be plus or minus 3. That's the algebra. Take square root something, you always get a positive and negative answer. But this x represents a component of a distance, right? If I plug negative 3 in for that x, I get 4 times negative 3 gives me negative 12 for length. Can, can length be negative 12? No. So it really tells me that 3 is the only answer that I'm looking for. Negative 3 is what we refer to as an extraneous solution. It doesn't really work for the, uh, the content of the question. So... Plugging that value in here, that would give me 12, and that would give me 9. Take 12 times 9, I get 108. Okay, so that information is true. And if I compare 9 over 12, well, that's 3 times 3. In the bottom, it's uh, 3 times 2 times 2. Those 3s cancel out. Okay, do you have a 3 to 4 or a 4 to 3 relationship? Okay, so you can always double check yourself that way once you have your concrete values for the side length. Just make sure that they, they still exist in the, the ratio that's presented. Does that work? Okay. Um, so then that, that thing is, you know, area. Eventually, we'll talk maybe about doing this with a volume, okay? And then uh, might incorporate something different, okay? A different governing uh, formula or, or procedure. All right, so let's get into these last ones. You guys want to talk about 31, 32? All right. And this is what uh, tonight's homework is going to mainly focus on is questions like 31, actually. Uh, 32, I want to do it with you. I want to talk about it, but it's going to be um, a much more difficult task than what 31 is. And also what I want you guys to understand is as we've been doing these throughout the class, uh, you might 
just, and it's, it's just the nature of the questions and the nature of the, the coefficients that are provided. Uh, you might end up doing the work that we need to go through and coming up with a special type of situation. Okay, and that's that's the thing about factoring. Remember in factoring last year, Mrs. Cole's class, uh, you would learn from factoring, or, or Mr. McCoy's Mr. her class, you would learn from factoring rules of just basically the most general type of quadratic equation. And then you would start seeing maybe some specific special cases. It's the way our stuff kind of works out, and then the way we start with coefficients and ratios in this, this section, you might get that general type of equation most of the time, but every once in a while you might get a special case, and we have to know how do we address these special cases. Um, for instance, when we looked at, oh, I got, I got rid of it. Yeah. Um, maybe I can reproduce one here in a little bit to show you the special situation. <clears throat> All right, so this one is 31. Um, and everybody's were very similar. Uh, really, the only things that changed were your 16 and your 3 or your negative 6 and your 2. The x's stayed what they were. So everybody had uh, a 1x here and a 1x here. So what we like to do is to solve this thing is we use cross products, right? So 16 times 3. Gives you 48. Then you're going to do the cross products of your extremes. So now I'm going to be deliberate. I'm going to write a lot of this stuff down so we don't lose anybody. We get x minus 6 and x plus 2. And if you're able to write that, you are a fabulous, wonderful, awesome geometry student. Because that's what we learned yesterday, right? And the day before is that... The cross products or the, the product of the extreme is equal to the product of the means. That's all you gotta do. Okay? But now to tell everybody that we've actually got that, we have to go through the algebra, right? So here is the algebra. What is when you see algebra like this, when you see x minus six times x plus two, what what process do you go through here? You distribute, good. Okay. And how many times are you gonna distribute? Twice. You're going to distribute this thing to this stuff, right? And if I do that, x times this stuff would give me, x times x gives me x squared, right? And x times 2 gives me 2x. And what I just did there is I multiplied the first things together, x and x, and I multiplied the outside things together, right? So when you do f and o, you're distributing that thing to both parts over there. Right? Now, like Jay said, we distribute twice. Now we're going to distribute the negative 6 to that and to that. When I multiply negative 6 times x, you get negative 6x, right? Take negative 6 times 2, I get negative 12. Did I just multiply the inside terms and then the last terms? Does that make sense? That's foiling. And foiling, what I want you guys to understand, because it's important later on in your algebra courses, foiling is just a repetitive process of distributing. You take the, in the first binomial, you take x, and you multiply it by everything else in the second binomial. Okay? Then you take the next term, negative 6, and you multiply it by everything else in the second term, or second binomial. Okay? And that's useful when you get to bigger things, right? Um, there's kind of a side note here. I have like x minus 6 times x squared plus 2x minus 3. There is no longer uh, just an f. There, there is first times first and last times last. But there's a lot more stuff in regards to outside and inside, right? But what we do is we take this x and multiply it by everything over here. Then we take this 6 and we multiply it by everything over there. And you distribute it twice. Does that make sense? Okay, so... Um, that's something that you guys are going to do a lot of uh, later on in other algebra courses. Uh, we also still have this equation equal to 48 over here. This expression equals 48. Doing a little preliminary work here. We get x squared. We get by my like terms, I get negative 4x minus 12. And there's a 48 here, right? 
And hopefully you guys recognized at this stage right there, you got that power of two, and it carries on through here. You get power of two. When you see powers of two, what is the word that we should always think about? Factor. Should always factor. And when we factor, we want to set things equal to what number? Zero. When we get things equal to zero, that's going to it's going to allow us to use what eventually we call the zero proc property, uh, which is really nice for us. So I want to get this number here to be zero. So subtract 48 from both sides. And that 48 needs to be removed from the 12, right? From the negative 12. So we get x squared minus 4x, and that's going to give me minus 60. Is that all right? And all that stuff is what we learned in Algebra 1. I think they're starting to do that stuff right now. Okay? Um, and everything that we do beyond this is still Algebra 1. Okay? Uh, and, and I say that not to, not to hurt feelings of people that don't know how to do this yet, but to open your eyes on how important this class is for next year's class. Does that make sense? Because if you're a person saying, well, I, kind of, I relaxed in, in Algebra 1 because I thought maybe that was only impacting Algebra 1. And I, I could start fresh. From scratch to geometry. That's not happening, right? Okay, so my hopes are that you realize that when Algebra 2 starts, you're not starting from scratch. There's a lot of geometry and a lot of Algebra 1 in it. Uh, when you go to college algebra, there's a lot of Algebra 1, Algebra 2, geometry, okay? Uh, same thing with the integrated course, if, you, if that's the avenue you guys want to go at some point. Uh, there's a lot of preliminary work that you have to go through. That's why the courses are set up in the way they are. Um, never starting from scratch in a math course in high school. Okay. Um, what we're looking for here on this, this right-hand side is two numbers that multiply together to give me negative 60 and add to give me negative 4. And the reason we're doing that, the reason I, I jump straight to that is because I know that that number right there is a 1. If that number was not a 1, I would not do this. Okay, there would be a different approach. So what are two numbers that multiply together to give me negative 60 and add to give you negative 4. Right? Negative 10 and 6. So what we do is we rewrite this as x minus that 10, which is the, the negative 10 you gave me, and then x and then plus that 6. And that 1 right there, that 1 out in front of the x squared, is what allows that there and that there to be the same term. It allows them both to be 1x. Because what we are doing, factoring, think about that. You've heard me say this before. Factoring is a fancy word for what operation? Adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing. Factoring is a fancy word for division. Okay? Think about if I gave you a number like 60, and I asked you to factor so you told me 6 and 10, right? Well, how did I get that one? I took 60 divided by 6, and it gave me that one, right? So we're dividing. So what happens here is that when we factor this, this was a product, like maybe this 60. And now we broke it down to two things that I know are going to multiply together to give me that product. Well, if I multiply these together using the foiling technique, x times x gives me x squared. Negative 10 times x gives me negative 10x. x times 6 gives me positive 6x. Add those together, I get my negative 4x. Last times last gives me my negative 60. Does that make sense? Okay. The reason we do this is because now it, it rewrites this blue expression as this red expression down here, but it's nice because now it's a product of two objects. And a product of two objects gives me zero. It means one of those objects, x minus 10, had to be zero, or x plus 6 had to be zero. And now I get this one say x is equal to 10, and this one say x is equal to negative 6. Those are not numbers that are easily um, garnered or being able to take out of that blue expression, that blue equation, written in the form that the blue equation is written. Does that make sense? Okay, but it's really easy once we write it in the red expression to pull those out. Okay, so what that means to me is those are the values of x that make that proportion true. Okay, so if I plug in 10 up here, what's 10 minus 6? 4, so I get 4 sixteenths. Over here, I get 3. And what's, uh, you know, 10 again would be 12, right? What's 4 times 12? 
48. What's 16 times 3? 48. So 10 is an answer. Now we're trying negative 6. What's negative 6 minus 6? Negative 12. So you get negative 12 over 16, right? And then up here I get 3. Now negative 6 plus 2 would give me negative 4. What's 16 times 3? 48. What's negative 12 times negative 4? 48. Okay. So again, that's true. That works. You always got to check these though. When you get two answers, you always got to check both of them because sometimes they both don't work. Okay. Is that okay? Let's do it this way. Let me write this equation down. We had x squared x squared minus 4x minus 60 is equal to 0, right? Do you guys remember from Algebra 1 that thing right there? Okay, so let me paste that in here. Remember what that's called? Quadratic formula, okay? Well, why is it called the quadratic formula? That's because anything in this format here, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, and we say where a, b, and c are real numbers. So a could be any number it wants to be, b could be any number it wants to be, c could be any number it wants to be, is in the format of a quadratic equation. So quadratic formula is going to factor any quadratic equation if we know how to pluck out what A and B and C are. So for this problem, this would be A. Okay, it's an understood one there, right? This number here, and you got to take the sign with it, so that would be B. And then this number here would be C. All right, we're only taking the coefficients. I don't. I know my brace here has X kind of in there, but we're only taking the number. So now, you know, a lot of people like to do it this way. They like to list that A was 1. B was negative 4. C was negative 60. Perfectly fine to do that. Um, but now working through this, I'm just plugging stuff into my formula. What's the opposite of B? What's the opposite of that number right there? 4, right? And, and you could write this way. That, that negative always has to be there. So I could write negative, and then B was negative 4. So I write that, but do we ever write minus a negative like that? Just a positive, right? So that's why I write it as opposite of B. Or, or I phrase it that way. Plus or minus then. Now B squared. So what's negative 4 squared? Minus and 4. And then A. A was our 1, right? And C then is negative 60. All over 2A. A was 1, right? Now, the, the trade-off for using this formula, because now I don't have to use that proxy sum technique and uh, do that kind of shortcut for factoring, but the, the trade-off is now i got to understand order of operations. i got to be able to multiply and add and divide and know square roots and that kind of stuff. Um, what is um, the operations that need to be done inside this first if I want to evaluate? PEMDAS needs to be done, right? That's, that's what I mean by evaluating. So which comes first? Adding, subtracting, or multiplying and dividing? Multiplying. multiplying. So I need to do this negative 4 times 1 times negative 60. Well, what's negative 4 times negative 60? 240, okay? So right now I get 4 plus or minus. It gives me 16 plus 240, right? All over 2. But what's 16 plus 240? 256. Okay, so we have to evaluate and figure out what that number under the radical is. 256, anybody know what kind of number that is? It is a perfect square. What is the square root of 256? Sixteen. I just can't hear you guys. Um, so we have 16. All right, so at this stage, now we kind of deal with what the plus or minus means. It means I have 4 plus 16 divided by 2, or I have 4 minus 16 divided by 2. It means really I've got two answers here, two, uh, two solutions. Uh, what's 4 plus 16? 
20. What's 20 divided by 2? 10. 4 minus 16 is negative 12 divided by 2? Negative 6. Were those the two same answers that we found previously? Yeah. Okay. Now, the more you use this, obviously the quicker you get at it, the better you get at it. You're going to learn a lot of these radicals pretty quickly because they, they repeat themselves a lot in the problems that we do. But that quadratic formula will factor anything that is in the format of ax squared plus bx plus c. a, b, and c can be any numbers they want to be. Does that make sense? And even later on in other math classes, they start being numbers that maybe you've never seen before. Okay? And, uh, you know, we like them to be... Uh, uh, integers, okay, whole numbers that are positive or negative, uh, but they could be square roots, they could be uh, irrational numbers, and, and we can still do this work, and that's kind of what we deal with in, in college algebra, you, you open your eyes a little bit to it in, in algebra 2, uh, but this is going to be something that you guys are going to use all the time, is that alright? That being said, that should help us with questions like 32, okay, now I know Kind of running short on time here, but I think maybe we can use an example here that has relatively small coefficients, so it shouldn't be too bad. But there's two techniques to this, okay? One of them is called the A times C method, which you have been exposed to in, in algebra one. The other one is quadratic formula, because quadratic formula is your default, always factorable process. Does that make sense? Always go to that if, you, if, um, if you're struggling with an alternative technique. So I'm going to cross multiply here. It gives me 6 plus 6x, six right? Okay. Just for time's sake, I'm going to do that multiplication as well, but I'm not going to write it all out. I'm just going to do it in my head. So 5 times 2 is 10. Uh, 5 times 5x is 25x, right? Okay. Uh, and then negative 6x times 2 is negative 12x. So you guys agree that gives me 13x? And then last times last would give me negative 30x squared. Okay. So that's that formula process. Obviously, um, if you need to be more deliberate with it, please do so. Uh, but just to save a little bit of time here, um, I'm going to write it that way. So I need to get 0 on this side. So I'm going to subtract 6 from this side and subtract it from that side. So it's going to give me a 4 in that spot. I need to move this 6x over. So it's going to subtract here with the, the 13x. So 13x minus 6x is 7x. And I've got my negative 30x squared, right? Now, algebra 1 should have taught you we don't like to write it that way. We should always have this in descending order, meaning that your largest exponent needs to come first. So I'm going to start moving things around. When you move things around on one side of the equal sign, you're using the commutative property of addition, and you have to take the signs with you. So I'm going to move this 30x squared. i got to take the negative with me. I'm going to leave the 7x where it's at in the middle, and this 4 is a positive 4, so it becomes plus 4 over here. Does that make sense, everyone? All right. Now, what was nice about the last question is this number right there was a 1, right? Now it's a negative 30. The first thing you always do, and you recall this, and then algebra 1 is if, if that number is 30 or negative 30, can you make it a one-third division? Is that a GCF out of every single term up there? And if I every single term, you get a whole number by a third. No. Okay? So that sinks. Um, you can also maybe look, well, maybe I can reduce it. Okay? Maybe everything has a, a 2 that come out of it. Okay? The 30 has a 2 that come out of it. The 4 does, but the 7 doesn't. Right? There's really no GCF here that's going to make things any easier. These are the numbers we have to get stuck with, we live with. Um, there is one thing I can do, though, that might make things easier. Can I multiply everything by negative 1? What's 0 times negative 1? 0. What's negative 30 times negative 1? 30. What's 7 times negative 1? Negative 7 and 4. Negative 4. The reason I do that is because I like this number out here to be positive. You don't have to do it, but I like to be positive. Um, the A times C method, that's A, and that is C. And the A times C method says to multiply those two things together. 
And now think of two numbers that multiply together to give me negative 120, but add to give me negative 7. Negative 120 and add to give me 7. You got any numbers in the top of your head that can do that? 15, 15 and 8 work? Okay, so which one of those got to be positive? The 8, right? So negative 15, positive 8. So this is what we do. We rewrite this entire blue equation. The 30x squared, the a term stays the same. I don't mess around with the negative 4. But now that negative 7x, we rewrite as a sum of those two things. Negative 15x plus 8x. You remember doing a little bit of this last year, maybe? Okay. At this stage, it's called factor by grouping. Okay. Um, so we use the AC method to really generate this thing here. But my hopes are that you realize... What we've done is just conveniently taken this number here, this negative 7x, and turned it into a sum of two things. Is that still, if I add those together, does that still give me negative 7x? Yeah. But you have to use this A times C method to do that because you can't just choose arbitrary values because there's an infinite number of things that will add together to give me negative 7, right? Okay. These are the two that are going to make this thing kind of work nicely. We're going to then group these two together. And then we'll group these back two together. What can come out, now, now once you do this, you look at the, the red terms, and we're going to focus just on the red terms. What is the greatest common factor for those red terms? 15, 15x, right? So when I take 30x squared and divide it by 15x, what do you get? 2x. And when I take 15x and I divide it by 15x, I get 1, right? And it's going to be negative in this case. Now, to make sure I've done that right, could I FOIL, or sorry, distribute that back through and make sure I get that? And I would, right? Now, look back here at these. What can I take out of both those? Take out a 4. So, 8x divided by 4 gives you 2x. Negative 4 divided by 4 gives you negative 1, right? Now, remembering from last year... If this works, if you've done it right, the things in the parentheses should be the same, right? And that becomes one of your factors, 2x minus 1. Does anybody remember what the other factors become? 15x plus 4. The things that are on the outside, right? And that gives me 0. It's going to multiply those together, give me 0. What we've done there, guys, that stuff I have in that last line, that black 2x minus 1 times 15x plus 4. If you multiply that out and you decoil, you get back up to the blue line up top that says 30x squared minus 7x minus 4. We've rewritten that quadratic equation in a more convenient manner. So now what that allows us to do is solve x to be, what, 1 half here? And here x will be negative 4 fifteenths. And those... I'm kind of cheat here. Those are both answers here. I would I would we need to make sure that I plug in these values of x to make sure that they both work, both give me true statements, and they do. Okay. Now that's hard, right? Okay. We need first first understand things that are hard do not mean that we don't need to learn them. But if you've got an alternative approach, my hopes were that we maybe if we struggle with the factor by grouping, we maybe knew that that will factor anything, right? Could I let 30 be my A value, negative 7 be my B value, and C be my negative 4? Plug those in there, evaluate, and you will end up with 1 half and negative 4 15. Okay? Right. Now we're running out of time to show that. I will, at the end of the day, when you guys leave, I'll... I'll go through and, and plug that in there and I'll post that so if you are a person who wants to see that, you can go back and look at that video. Is that all right? Okay. Um, I will... Okay, finishing this up. If we're going to uh, try to use quadratic formula with that thing there. Uh, obviously, A is 30, B is negative 7, C is negative 4. Plug those things in over here so the opposite of B, so it would be positive 7 in this case, plus or minus 
Now b squared, so negative 7 squared is 49, minus 4, a is 30, and c is negative 4, all over 2a. 2a would be 60 in this case. So we get that. Um, so now, I don't know what that was in, in the hallway if you're hearing that. Uh, we have 7 plus or minus uh, 49. Minus 4 times 30 times 94. We need to evaluate that. Um, so 4 times 130 is 120. Uh, multiply that then by this 4 here. You should get uh, what, 480. Okay. Um, and so we pause this. So I get now 49 plus 480 all over 60. So now order of operations, you start over again. And I need to do the 49 uh, plus 480. Okay, so 49 plus 480 gives me eventually 7 plus or minus. Okay, so that's going to be, I'm going to do 480 plus 50. So 480 plus 50 would be 530. Um, but remove 1, so it's going to be 529 over 60. Okay, uh, now the hopes are maybe you don't know this. Uh, but that 529, and a lot of times uh, our hopes are that that's going to be a, a perfect square. Uh, so maybe just grab your calculator and see what 529 is. Okay, so it's uh, 23. When I take square root of it, you get 7 plus or minus 23 over 60. Now if I look at those values, what that means to us is we get 7 plus 23 over 60. We get 7 minus 23 over 60. So 7 plus 23 is 30 over 60. And we're seeing that, that obviously that will reduce to 1 half, which is that 1 half that we found using the A times C method. And then 7 minus 23, well, that's, um, what, negative 15. Okay. Um, and then, I'm oh, sorry, negative 15, negative 16 over 60. Okay, uh, both those divide by 4, so that will give me negative 4 over 15, which is exactly that value which we found using the A times C method. So what I want to show you is, uh, obviously, the, uh, the quadratic formula uh, will always work, okay? Uh, but the payoff of using the quadratic formula, something that will always work and that we know will always work, is that we have to obviously know the formula, but two, we have to be able to do this evaluation here. We need to be able to do PEMDAS, um, go through my order of operations several times to evaluate and simplify. Um, the contrast to that is uh, if I don't want to use a quadratic formula, then I need to be able to learn or know uh, this process of factoring uh, that incorporates the A times C method and the eventual factor by grouping. The idea is or thought is as you progress through Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry, these two things become synonymous. You, 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 you do one, you're doing the other one, okay? Um, uh, or you, you understand that this process here is the exact same thing as this quadratic formula. This quadratic formula is the exact same thing as this process because they get me to the same answer. And if, if we thought about it and worked things out, they, they are very well aligned, if not the same. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is you need to know how to do both. Uh, there will be situations where it, it is much more beneficial to go this approach here. And then there will be on the contrast other questions that it's much more beneficial to go through this approach. Um, there are times that this does not work over here. This will not um, develop these two arguments here to be the same. So factor by grouping doesn't work. And then what do we do? Okay, well, it should still be factorable. So then we have to turn to this because this we know will factor anything. Okay, so hopefully we, we take that for... Uh, what it is, and uh, heed my, uh, I don't want to say warnings, but heed my uh, advice uh, that the quadratic formula and factoring are going to be things that are uh, very, very informative to you. I think uh, through high school, um, you know, one of the top three things that you will learn and, and really want to master uh, for high school math and, and, and really math beyond that is factoring. Okay, the more uh, proficient you are in that, the easier the, the upcoming course is going to be. <clears throat>